I wanted to sketch in the way I see the problems of sustainability and responsibility and to argue that it's now time to take responsibility. Sustainable tourism and responsible tourism are definitely not the same thing. Sustainability is an abstract long-term goal and most of the industry and most governments work on short-termism. So they're never going to achieve sustainability. Responsible tourism is about what people actually do to achieve sustainability. So there's a difference between the abstract aim and what you do to achieve it. And really the focus of the WTM Responsible Tourism Programme is on people who are doing things to achieve sustainability. We're 40 years on now from the 1972 World Commission on Environment and Development. There have been four world summits in that time, every 10 years. 1972 also saw publication of the limits to growth, which people laughed about at the time and said it would never happen. In reality, some checks that were done by the Melbourne, by Melbourne University demonstrated that those projections were almost entirely correct and the limits to growth are a serious problem for us as a species. We're simply not making progress fast enough. Now, over-tourism is what happens. We know about the over-tourism in, in Spain, particularly in Barcelona, but it's also a problem in Britain. The photograph on the top right there is of Snowdon on an August Bank holiday Monday. Now, who on earth wants to go up Snowdon and have to wait to summit um, in a queue? This is not a great experience. So over-tourism is what happens when tourism is not managed sustainably. It's the opposite of responsible tourism. It's the antithesis of what the WTM program is about. It's a consequence of not having placed sufficient priority on sustainability over the last 40 years. People have kept talking about it, but they haven't done it. They're always putting off doing something about it. UNWTO have started their Travel Enjoy Respect campaign and that reflects the fact that obviously consumers need to be responsible too because it's the way we behave in destinations which to a significant extent creates the problem of over-tourism. The, the, the photograph on the left there is a genuine photograph. Cricketer Holidays ran it only once. They're a good company. I'm not criticising them at all. But they said they spoke the truth. Whenever a place gets spoilt, we move on. The consequence, of course, is what's called in Barcelona sometimes castle owner. Good for the tourists, bad for the neighbours. What we all aspire to is the kind of thing they have in Ludlow, where visitors are treated as temporary residents. It's a much different experience to go there. But they manage their tourism so that they don't get too many visitors. The WTM programme next year, the two major themes will be over-tourism and coping with success. They're obviously the same theme. It's just that some people are still in denial about having a problem with over-tourism. But next year's major theme will be over-tourism. I just wanted to pick up on some of the major issues as I see them. Carnival Cruises, the chief has come out and said recently that the industry must listen to locals on the issue of over-tourism. We'll see what happens, but that is a senior industry leader beginning to recognise that there's a problem. Another big problem we have is greenwashing. It's a real challenge. Responsible tourism is now just trotted out like sustainable tourism used to be. And we need to challenge that. Because what we don't need is a levelling down of what's meant by responsibility. We need to be challenging people to be very clear about what they're actually doing and what the impacts of their actions are. The evidence matters, and you'll see that in the Responsible Tourism Awards on Wednesday morning on the global stage. We're recognising then some of the leaders in Responsible Tourism, and they have the evidence to demonstrate that they are making a difference. It's more than just words. We create the carbon emissions. Any of you have seen the latest news coming out of America, it's very clear that the problem is getting worse fast. The scientists' predictions, and these are American scientists, is a global sea level rise of up to eight feet by the end of the century. Risks of drought and flooding, we've already seen that. More frequent wildfires and devastating storms. The argument about climate change will fester and continue. 
but the reality is that we need to deal with it now. And the scale of that problem, you can see in the hotel industry. This is Green Hotelier, the voice of the International Tourism Partnership, saying that hotels' climate change commitment means 90% reduction in carbon. That's an ambitious target and it needs to be reached. New this year, we've got an emphasis on plastic pollution. We're very pleased to have the, the stand there. We've entered the, the Anthropocene, and by that I mean that you can now see in the geological record the pollution from our civilizations. Plastic will be there in the geology of Britain for the foreseeable future. It's a big challenge, and the tourism industry is a big contributor to it. The sustainable tourism goals have not really been taken up. We've had a year of the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. A few companies have responded, but really it's been very disappointing. There has been more progress this year on the issue of orphanage tourism. We have two sessions tomorrow, one on orphanages, the other on human trafficking, which will be some of the best sessions, I think, of this year's programme. Don't miss them if you're here. And finally, I wanted to remind you all that the issue is about taking responsibility. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Jeremy. Um, ha hello, Harold. It's Jeremy Smith, a writer, editor of Trevindi. Um, you started by talking about the limits to growth from 40 years ago, and we've been therefore talking about the problems for 40 years, um, and you made small reference to Ludlow as somewhere that you see as a success. Other than just abstractions, what do you see that is actually making a difference and working? I think the problem is, Jeremy, that there are lots of individual examples by particular companies, some of them here today. The problem is that the vast bulk of the industry is not changing. And it's not until we see change in the bulk of the industry. And that's why I've always argued against the focus on ecotourism. So it's very easy to say that Responsibility is, is over there with the ecotourism. What we need to be addressing is the mainstream tourism. And I guess the fact that the CEO of Carnival Cruises has come out and said there's a problem about over-tourism is possibly a big step forward. But it depends what happens after that. The words are the easy bit. The doing something about it is more difficult. But I hope in the programme next year we'll have people from the cruise industry talking about how they're going to address the problem of over-tourism. But you, I mean, The UNWTO makes it very clear that in their mind, growth is not the problem with over-tourism, it's how we manage it. And yet you're saying that 40 years ago it was growth and we continue to say that. So we're at different, we are differing there. No, I think that the, the UNW show is rightly concerned about tourism phobia. A phobia and I think they're right to be that. Um, but the, the phobia of tourists is when the tourists are not managed in a sustainable way. Now we can increase the number of tourists going to places sustainably if we put the investment into management but you won't be able to solve the problem that way forever there comes a point where you simply can't absorb any more people which is why we hear people now talking about limiting the number of people in St Mark's Square or, or I would like to see a limit on the number of people in Trafalgar Square there's a number of places around the world which are over visited and Snowden clearly has a big problem with capacity on bank holidays so another question so, hi, my name is Karen. I'm from Speedy to Travel. And um, you mentioned about this, this year, of course, being the International Year of Sustainable Tourism. And you said that it hasn't been very successful. In your, in your mind or in your vision, what, what would have been a successful, a successful year for international sustainable tourism? When we launched the awards on the Sustainable Development Goals in May, I was hopeful that we would see a larger number of applications. We still store very good applications. I don't want to take away from the winners. They are excellent applications this year. But I was surprised that there were so few. And the, really, the shift that needs to come now is people need to be challenged, not just to talk the talk, but to demonstrate what they've achieved in terms of impacts by what they're doing. Do you have any idea why, the, why there was so little application? Why there was so... So few applications? I think because we put a lot of emphasis on having the data to back up the statements that people were making. But that's the way it's going to go. And there's a panel tomorrow on certification, for example, making exactly that point. We need to move on from just certification to people talking about what they've actually delivered.
Increasingly, development agencies are using tourism as a means of poverty alleviation. However, all too often, they seem to overlook the economic, environmental, and social impacts of their interventions. But surely, I hear you say, aren't they doing this already? Well, the answer is that almost all talk the sustainability talk, but very few walk it in an impactful way. I'm going to present three very simple solutions. But first, let me start by giving you some context of the role of tourism in the developing world as a tool for poverty alleviation. Despite the focus of development agencies and the government on pro-poor growth over the last 20 years, poverty remains one of the world's greatest challenges. In 2013, almost 1 billion people, that's 12.7 of the global population, continue to live below the poverty line. Tourism is one of the world's fastest growing industries, and it has the ability to contribute directly or indirectly to all of the sustainable development goals. It represents one of the top five sectors for 83% of developing countries, and for many, it ranks as their first. Since the 1990s, development agencies have been increasingly investing in tourism as a tool for pro-poor economic growth, bringing in much needed foreign investment, foreign currency. However, the quest for short-term economic growth often leads to significant negative impacts on environmental, social, and economic systems. For example, uh, poor communities have been known to lose a lot of their water supply as the demand for hotels takes priority. Locals have been forced to leave their villages because the cost of living has become too high. Gentrification for the purpose of tourism has forced land price inflation and forced them out. And cultural norms have been severely disrupted by, an inappropriate, by inappropriate behavior of tourists. Whilst development, agencies, <coughs> sorry. whilst development agencies have had some success in reducing poverty, the overall impact has been seriously compromised by their inefficient attention to sustainability issues. So why is it that sustainability has not been embedded by development agencies? There are five key reasons. And the first is an insufficient understanding of sustainability. For development agencies, sustainability tends to mean the ability of the program's activities to continue once the funding has finished. It's not about the wider economic, social, and environmental impacts. The second reason, sustainability is not integrated into the planning and investment phases and decisions. The lack of knowledge means that it's often not prioritized and it's often brought in in year two or three of a program. It's not actually brought in in the, in the design and investment scenario decision stages. It's usually considered a cross-cutting issue like gender which means that development agencies tend to have some sustainable tourism activities, but it's not embedded into the DNA of their programs. The third reason, many development programs have too narrow a focus on increasing the incomes of the poor. Hey, I hear you say, why is that a problem? Well, they tend to ignore the potential negative environmental and social impacts of their programs on the poor. The fourth, time scale. Development programs themselves are too short. Two to three years is just too short a period to be able to realize any impactful results. The Aga Khan Development Network is one of the few development agencies that takes a 10 year or more view on their tourism programs, reaping excellent results in some of the world's most challenging developing countries. And the fifth and final reason, 
development agencies often don't collaborate with a sufficiently broad set of stakeholders, and they don't look beyond traditional development models. For example, they tend to overlook the potential of the private sector as a multiplier of the impact of their investment. The solution. So what is needed? Just three key, very simple actions. First, ensuring the economic, environmental, and social impacts are embedded throughout all stages of the program and are given equal weighting. <clears throat> and this isn't just about the program's activities, but it's also the wider impacts on the destination's sustainability. Just like businesses need to integrate sustainability into their business model, so too do development agencies. Second, working on longer time frames. Yes, it's more of a challenge. However, development agencies have to tackle their own internal barriers and take on board years and years of lessons, persistence lessons learned from around the world that actually short-term interventions are very seldom effective. And thirdly, simply building the capacity on how to genuinely implement sustainability not only for the beneficiaries or the program implementing partners, but also for the development agency staff themselves. So, if these three very simple things were embedded, not only would development agencies actually have a better chance of achieving their overall goal of poverty reduction, but they'd have a better chance of ensuring that destinations were more sustainable. And of course, all this can only be good for tourism businesses. For me, it's a no-brainer. So, I invite all development professionals working on tourism programs to start implementing these very three simple solutions. Are there any questions? Uh, Libby, you told us how it can happen. Can you tell us where it's happening? Sure. Um, I think uh, there are some development agencies that are actually implementing this, and most of those are using a new model which is called market M4P, or a market systems development approach, which is taking a systemic approach to development. It's a shift away from traditional development models. Um, it's about engaging the private sector and making sure that these partnerships with the private sector can be leveraged and leverage their own investment. Uh, it's happening in places like in Laos and Cambodia. Swiss Contact is an excellent agency who are implementing sustainability right from the planning and investment phases and partnering with the private sector as well. Um, there, are, there are quite a few other destinations, but uh, certainly Swiss Contact, uh, you'll hear very shortly that GIZ uh, are also partnering with the private sector and taking a different approach with Explore. Um, and specifically looking at the private sector, uh, you didn't mention, but one of the problems is that the amount of money invested can be very high, but then leakage of an awful lot of the money going back out again without actually reaching the men and women it needs to get to. Um, we're seeing this week with the publication of the Paradise Papers and it's picking up on the Panama Papers. That there's an awful lot of complex tax avoidance going on that means in the private sector, money that's supposed to reach where it's you know, originally destined to simply doesn't get there. How can development agencies ensure they're not facilitating that? I think it's all about due diligence and these days development agencies are becoming much more, having to be much more accountable uh, back to their donors and actually to taxpayers on where their money is actually going and the impacts they're having. So uh, it really is about due diligence right from the very beginning in terms of planning and design phases. Thank you. question before you go back um, yeah so you, you, you've been speaking of um, development and tourism and you're talking of development agencies surely in tourism it's not the development agency that's supposed to be delivering the, de the, the, the development but rather the service provider on the ground that yep. your client is going to no, absolutely. And these new uh, models of development shift development agencies away from being 
the implementers and actually taking a role in the tourism market, shifting them away, and they simply become facilitators. So whilst uh, I completely agree with your, your statement, my subject is actually on development agencies, and they have a role to play because they are investing in tourism development programs, and their role is now much more about facilitation rather than actually becoming an actor in the tourism sector and fulfilling the role of other private sector people, the role that perhaps either the government or the private sector should be playing. There's a shift away from that. Sure, okay, I get that. So, so we're in tourism here, so how do we um, get on to the development agencies and gender to take our agenda? Well, I think you'll see um, a lot more development agencies attending some of these sessions here over the next few days. And development agencies are becoming a lot more aware about the whole sustainable tourism movement, responsible tourism movement. Um, in terms of how do you find out where these programs are and are they in countries where perhaps your business is operating? Um, maybe we can have a chat after this uh, and I can kind of tell you where some of the key investments are by development agencies. Yeah, please do, that's of interest. I say that because we're in tourism, like everybody else here, um, but we're a provider in Africa. Um, and the only reason that we're on the ground in Africa is to help development. So we're looking for people who want to invest in development, but we're not a development agency. Yeah, and that's why, that's a perfect example of where bringing the two together can have a fantastic impact compared to individual businesses and individual development agencies working separately. Thank you. Hi, Libby. Hello. Um, I'm uh, Peter Richards, and I uh, work a lot in Southeast Asia, also on um, uh, sustainable tourism, responsible tourism, community-based tourism projects. Uh, it was really uh, interesting. I agree with lots of the things that you've said. Uh, one thing I think, you know, working on the ground, um, if uh, our managers who are often based in, you know, in Europe, for example, uh, if they're open and they're, and they're listening to what we're, what we're saying and, you know, from the ground up, uh, especially when situations change, I mean, we write, write plans sometimes two or three years in advance, but then there's the real dynamic situation and, you know, having to be flexible and, um, you know, th this kind of thing. So I think one thing is uh, helping the, the bosses, you know, to have ways of being open and listening to feedback coming up from the ground. I think as you get a bit older, you have a few more air miles, it gets a bit easier to kind of manage up the chain, but when you're new, you know, it's, it's quite daunting. So that's my, my feedback on that, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think flexibility is absolutely key, particularly in development programs. Uh, the situ as you say, the situation on the ground is completely changing. And what you set out to do, you know, three years before, actually two, two years in can be, can be very different. Right, good morning everybody. My name is John Telfer. I'm a, I'm a tour operator. I'm not an NGO. I'm not a consultant. I'm not into aid. Um, but I had a very happy coincidence last May time. And uh, I'll, to put this into context, I'll explain very briefly what we do as a tour operator. We run trips to 130 countries, small groups, about 14 people. Each has got a leader, each has been trained by somebody in-house, uh, our house being in Farnborough in Hampshire. And an email came through. And normally you dismiss some emails, and it's from an organization called GIZ, which I'd never heard of before, ever. And it was one of those miracle emails. You know, it said, we'll provide support for providing training in a variety of countries to the tune of about 200,000 euros. Um, we've picked your company because of your links with sustainability, with our work at Surrey University, and on general risk management. And uh, it just seems impossible. So I did read it through to make sure it wasn't a scam. Got to the end of it, and I immediately gave them a ring. So that was last May, just before the Brexit referendum. And that's where I learned all about GIZ. I'd never heard of them before, but they are the second largest aid agency in the world, after USAID, I believe. 
And what they wanted to do was to form a commercial partnership. We wouldn't benefit financially, but they would provide the funding to get to people that we normally never, ever reach. Now, we will train the tour operators in country. They're the people that book our accommodation, our transport, the flights. We will train our tour leaders that escort our, our groups, and they're 95% local. But what I've always had a concern about is what about the extended supply chain? And I'm using jargon. I said I wouldn't use jargon before, but the extended supply chain, the drivers, the hoteliers, the local city guides, the people that never get any training or very limited training in many countries. So when we first spoke, it's all about adventure tourism. And my belief is that when it comes to risk management, and that's understanding the risks that you take, minimizing the chances of something going wrong, and when it does go wrong, having a plan in place, getting to these people is so, so important. It starts off with high-risk activities such as mountaineering, but gently I convince them to look at these people because that is where education and training is best spent, in my opinion, rather than on technical sports. They spoke to a couple of other people in the UK, and finally we signed our deal, our contract, in June last year. And from that point on, it's, it's flourished beyond what I expected. I mean, initially I thought, how is this going to work? Not having worked with a, an aid agency of any variety whatsoever, but they focus on deals with the private sector. What I love about them is that they train local people, so you don't have a Brit parachuted into a country. What their aim is, is to train up local people. And the way this is working is they're relying on our 36 years of experience of running tours to 130 countries and all kinds of different terrains and politics and standards. We've got a well-established risk management training system in place and to combine our experiences with other people's experiences, for example, Iceland has an excellent standalone risk management system called Vakin, along with the local people and not just what we think they need but also they reached out to local suppliers to find out what they wanted they sent jeeps up into the hills of kyrgyzstan they talked to drivers in georgia so it wasn't foisted it wasn't top down what it was was checking locally with the actual providers and then checking with the local tour operators or ground agents in our jargon and then combining their needs with our needs and our experience Originally, it was just going to be for the extended supply chain, but then it moved on quite quickly. And what we did was we provided six training sessions, webinars, which were accessible to anybody in those countries. When we first started, the important thing was it wasn't just for the people that we worked with. It was to work with people across the whole industry in Georgia, Macedonia, and Kyrgyzstan. Now, Libby earlier said about uh, time frames and the Aga Khan having 10 years. Well, I'm afraid ours is just three years, but it will be renewed, I hope. And if it does work, if it does work, GIZ, a bit like us, they work in 130 countries. And if we can do it, to move on to hubs in Nepal and Turkey and Morocco. But it's early days. It's only one and a half years into the whole setup. I'm not going to talk you through that because I think I've just touched on it. I'm not very good with PowerPoint. I just tend to speak. Um, but their view is you train the local people and you train the local people to train the local people. That way you build capacity in country. They brought a level of formalization that we are not used to as a tour operator using their experience. And we've learned a whole deal from this, this, this setup. And that we've actually used in other countries where we do training. It's looking at the service provider. How do you reach the service provider as a tour operator in the UK? It's almost impossible, the extended supply chain. That was why I was so happy when we had this opportunity to work with GIZ. And not just in the capitals, get out to the sticks, up into the mountains, well away from the places where training, if any, normally takes place. It's not just the local service providers, but also the tour operators in country. If you can sensitize 
the main people in the capitals, the people that hire the extended supply chain, then the chances of this working is going to be much, much better. So we decided to set up training sessions for the tour operators that hire the extended supply chain and then start training the extended supply chain themselves. It's all done in the local language. This is one from Kyrgyzstan, backed up by a certificate of attendance. Again, it's not a certification at all, but it's to show that people have been there for the training branded some stuff up which is visible for people to, 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 it creates a bit of an impact. And this was the first session a couple of months ago in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan where people were taught basic risk management, instant management, first aid training, you know, how to avoid a crisis happening in the first place by some very, very basic safety checks, but when things do go wrong, to have a plan in place or how to build a plan. That brings me to the end. Sorry to speed you through all that, but I'd be delighted to take any questions from the floor. Are there any questions? I've got one for you, John. Um, you, of course, were brought in as experts to use the knowledge that you have from working in hundreds of hundreds plus countries around the world. What have you taken from it? How is your business changing as a result of the experiences? A good question, which I've been asked by several people, why on earth are you committing all your knowledge to effectively open source? Well, in many countries, there's a finite number of hotels, there's a finite number of drivers. Um, all tour operators use them. So yes, if I'm improving the lot for our agents and other agents and the extended supply chain, we all use this extended supply chain. So we're benefiting other tour operators, other competitors are benefiting as well. But that's, that's not an issue for me. It's about building capacity, it's by training, and that way, with that, it protects or can protect the reputation of the tour operators, the extended supply chain, and also the country itself when it comes to incoming tourism. And how extended, when you say supp extended supply chain, I mean, tourism likes to look at an extremely extended supply chain when it talks about its, say, 10% you know, of GDP. It extends it as far out as hospitals and the money we spend on, say, pets when we go away from, on holiday. How extended is your work in the supply chain talking about? Um, this is a starter project. So we're looking at training around 150 guides and drivers and about 10 tour operators in each country. And when we went through this, I mean, the GIZ were incredibly rigorous, but I guess you expect that of the Germans. Um, it was extremely rigorous. Everything was laid out, all the funding, absolutely every single penny spent has to be accounted for. And I've never come across anything like it. Like, I'm, I'm a stranger to this kind of world. And that surprised me. Um, but actually, I stood back from it and thought this is the proper way to do things, to make sure there's the maximum leakage into the local economy um, not spending money on highly paid foreign consultants to build capacity in country and for everybody to benefit. And then finally, you said that it's, you're open sourcing it. Um, now you're working in three very specific Central Asian countries, sort of mountainous regions, Caucasus. Mm -hmm. But say someone's sitting here and they're listening to you, but they're from the Caribbean or from yeah. Africa. Is it easily adaptable, easily replicable, the information? The three, the three centers that we initially chose, um, we wanted to go to areas where we could see the, the biggest potential improvements. It's also a trial, and we're learning lessons as we go along. And once we get to the next stage, which will be in two and a half years, that's when we try to extend it to other countries. Now, we're not showing, we're not sharing everything worldwide because it, it, it's, it's pointless. There has to be a structure to it. It has to be training. Um, if there's anybody here from Macedonia or Kyrgyzstan or, or Georgia that isn't part of this, by the way, drop me a line. It is free. I mean, there's no charge to this, by the way. This is not a financial venture in any way. If anybody from those three countries that's not involved, please contact me. If anybody's interested that works in other countries, then I can link you up with GIZ so we can tackle different places in about two years' time. Because Morocco, uh, Nepal, and uh, Turkey, they're not set hubs. And I think the way to go forward is to have hubs. Everything to be online, a lot of it is online at the moment. The issue is converting stuff from 
English to local languages, and that's one of the biggest hurdles if you want to get to the extended supply chain. Um, hi, John. Um, I work in Mozambique, and we're doing a lot of capacity building there. Would love to have something like this going on. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about recruiting or selecting, or how, how do you go about choosing the guides that you're training? And do you try to um, influence that in any way, gender or age or any other factor? Um, we don't try to influence. We're trying to reach as many people as possible. So in Kyrgyzstan, for example, we've got a number of stakeholders. Um, there's a number of tour operators there, local tourism author authorities, governmental bodies as well. So the, the whole aim is to encourage people to see this as something beneficial for the country, potentially, um, but definitely for the individuals and the individual tour operators, because by training, you will protect your reputation or increase the chance of protecting reputations when something goes wrong, and even better, prevent things from going wrong in the first place. So it's, I've, I've got no, no guiding hand in who's picked. This is all down to the local organizations. Okay, thanks. So it's very lovely to see you all. Thank you all for turning up. Um, I want to ask the question, can we actually ask guests to use substantially less resources while staying at accommodation? I used to think that that would not be possible because it would interrupt their satisfaction. It would rock the boat of their stay. But after meeting 16,000 guests and doing four years of research, I'm delighted to tell you that guests will participate and they will actually make significant savings. My name's Christopher Warren. I'm a responsible tourism consultant, but I'm also an owner of a small accommodation. I want to talk about two key factors that will advance responsible tourism. The first is knowledge and the second is participation. If we don't have the knowledge, we don't understand our footprint and we can't communicate how to reduce it and the guests will not have the know-how to help us. I think one of the key problems in our service sector is that we neglect the common sense, the practical knowledge, the observational skills of our staff. And we seem to forget that our guests use half the resources at hotels and almost all the resources at self-contained accommodation. Ignoring these will blunt any sustainable tourism progress. However, putting them together will give us a social technology that will empower and advance responsible tourism. Now, I say social technology because I've been focusing a great deal on what's called hard technology. Most of us in tourist accommodation are finding the challenges of reducing our carbon footprint, of trying to reduce our ecological footprint, and trying to work within the limitations of eco-efficient technology a problem. Yes, I've got instantaneous gas hot water systems. Yes, I've got insulation and so forth. But I got to a point which is frankly a green ceiling. I can't go forward because the capital investment and the return on investment and the environmental footprint of all this new technology is questionable, like lithium batteries. Shouldn't we be right now trying to reduce? And by that I mean actually conserve. That means actually asking the guests to use less. Would that jeopardize our relationship with the guest? So I've introduced an innovation called My Green Butler. It's a smart system that provides eco-feedback that helps guests reduce their consumption. After a 17-month trial at four sites, what were the results? Well, we achieved over 30% saving electricity and certainly a lot more savings in uh, gas and water and firewood. Importantly, we reduced our carbon emissions by 20% because the guests had managed to conserve their resources. All these savings are over and above the hard technologies. These are social technologies. Did it affect their satisfaction? Well, no. Or rather, yes, because actually they rather liked it. 
80% of people found the interchange, the interpersonal communication with our staff added, strongly added to this day. 70% said they found the eco-feedback very informative and of value. Now I've mentioned the interpersonal communication of staff. That's key, you have to train staff. So you can't just put somebody in front of a guest and say please use less, you've got to train them. And that means you've got to be able to explain the different technology that's in your accommodation, the advantages and disadvantages. You've got to be able to talk to people, different types of guests, different seasons and different weather conditions or even different times of day to help them understand how to reduce. Knowledge is persuasion. But also, obviously we can't just do this at one little accommodation provider. So I'm now trialling it in three countries across several different types of accommodation with some large NGOs and government organisations and I'm going to freely share the findings at mygreenbuffler.com. Sorry, I've got a cold. <clears throat> now, I've mentioned this whole thing about social technology because over 14 years I've analysed all our uh, sustainably orientated innovation and I found that nearly 40% of our innovations were organisational innovations. This is not surprising because we're in the service industry. We seem to be forgetting the importance of actually talking to each other and working together. And it's the interrelatedness between your suppliers, managers, team, guests, and of course your community. Now I'm going to give you a small example just to make the point, because I've tried to impress you with large numbers, now I'm going to impress you with small things. So now we don't give our guests milk in plastic containers, we buy in bulk and decant to glass bottles. We don't buy pre-packed butter, we buy bar butter in bulk and cut it into small portions. The guests are part of that process, they return those containers and ask for more. That's an example of social technology. It's small, it's symbolic, it shows we have integrity. We cannot ask people to make big savings if we waste so much. We have to tackle the big and the small, and that's really important. That it all requires training, and the training to meet health and safety standards, but it's very easy for any big business to push the button to say, we now have green energy, it's very difficult to make sure a big organization or a small organization can buy milk at a regular occurrence in the right quantity to make sure you don't waste anything to deliver something as simple as this. Sorry. So, training is essential. And what I've developed is a second innovation which is on a professional uh, development program. It contains 10 modules the first three are foundation modules of sustainability, responsibility and establishing green teams. And then we have four modules on environment and three modules on social factors. This is aimed for senior management of hospitality organisations. All these people out here, they're all very welcome to take the course. And what we're seeking to do is provide uh, concepts and theory in classrooms and then half the time it's actually implementing at your property and working with your green team and developing innovations obviously I'm hoping that most of those will be actually social technologies. Now what's so exciting is that this has now been taken up by one government who are accrediting this training and they're applying it across their world famous destination. It means that we'll be training 600 hotels, thousands of staff this government understands the importance of knowledge. You cannot change things if people do not understand the footprint and the methods to solve it. So at the same time, all these managers will be trained with the same values, with the same criteria across one single destination to create real innovation and progress. So in conclusion, I'm saying that social technology is a key factor of responsible tourism. And if we involve our staff, if we involve the guests, we can make substantial savings and substantial progress. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions?
Hi, um, my name is Eva Sturm. Um, I was just wondering, in which countries have you um, rolled out this program so far? Only in Australia or...? Uh, are you talking about the Green Butler or yeah, the train? The, the Green Butler is in Australia, it will be in Dubai, and it will be in the United Kingdom. Are you looking to expand, like, which would be the next places to expand to? I'm interested in expanding it across the globe, not to make money, but to get some change happening to all of this. Hi, it's actually in addition to uh, what was just asked right now. Um, do you see a difference in terms of cultures, in terms of people behavior connected to cultures during your trials? Yes, absolutely. Uh, culture is an important lever. Everybody is different. And I think the problem is that we are standardizing too much communication and too much assumption. If I, if I live in a country like, or let's say the Lake District, I do not understand the concept of water saving when I go to Egypt. It's just not in my everyday life. So we have to understand that people have different values and different life experiences, and we have to change that. That's why we need a green butler to help people, to guide people, just as we used to have. So your solution allows localizing? Must be completely localized. Okay, there's one question for me, Chris. Sure. Um, over the year, you've been looking to that we can do it, that communicating sustainability does work. What about how we communicate it? So how can how we, we... How do we communicate it? What, how what do moves, we communicate what it? tone? The tone, excellent. The tone is, is the same tone as that I've been using. It's called politeness. I've been polite to you and you have been polite to me. We haven't met each other, but we have an understanding of a certain etiquette. It's as simple as that. When you meet a guest that you've never met before, as a host, you're hospitable, but you guide them politely. We use it every day. Most of you have been looking at me with faces looking down. That's called negative politeness. A few of you are smiling at me, which is very nice, which is positive politeness. But we read these signs and understand that if somebody's face is down, that means they're thinking and contemplating what you say. You need to teach your staff, who can be younger than the guests, to read these indications so they have confidence and understand. That's, that's all it is. It's just talking to each other, as we do on the tube, getting the bus, helping each other as somebody's dropped something on the ground. We're really talking life at this level. Fran Hughes, International Tourism Partnership. Brilliant idea, the Green Butler. Um, but how can it be applied to bigger hotels where there's much less interaction with the guests? Well, well Fran, this is my argument with hotels. Um, while they start to try and automate everything, I'd like them all to consider to bring the idea of hospitality back to hotels, to employ people, to start talking to people. The more that hotels distance themselves from their guests, the harder it will be. The more hotels standardize their environments, the harder it will be. So I'm not going to suggest to you that I have a magic wand and this will solve everywhere the same way. It won't. But I do question this whole concept of how hotels are going and that they are losing that interpersonal communication with the guest. And we don't feel being respected, and we aren't treating them in the same way we might have done once. So I think it's a problem with their product, and they don't have the aspect of social technology that is key to enable them to advance, to make substantial savings, which don't cost a lot of money. Hi everyone, we're Unseen Tours. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to be here today. We're really excited to share with you Unseen Tours, our story, a bit about what we do and our history. Um, I'm Jenny, I'm tour coordinator for the Camden Tour at Unseen Tours and director. And this is Pete, who is one of our brilliant tour guides. Um, and we'll hand over to Pete in a minute to give you a bit of an insight into his Brick Lane Tour, which is one of four tours that we have running in London at the moment. So, to start off, um, so who are we? So, we're a volunteer driven, not for profit social enterprise that offers tours around London uh, run by formerly homeless, homeless, and vulnerably housed guides. 
So our tours aim to offer unique insights into some of London's social and cultural quirks and where homelessness topics are covered, um, cover, uh, give an insight into some of the state of the world as it is and insight into some of the social injustices that exist. So how do we operate? We, um, guides often are recommended to us from other organizations or they hear about us um, from our current guides or they come on a tour because they've seen our tours operating in the area. Uh, we co-construct every element of our tours with our guides to really sh show their personality, creativity and their resourcefulness. We build a relationship with our guides and they propose what they would like to cover in their tour, what personal stories um, they would like to have in there because they, are the best, they have the best knowledge of the area that they're working in. Um, so we are not a charity, we're a social enterprise. So 60% of the revenue goes directly to the tour guides themselves. And then remaining revenue uh, is used to cover essential operating costs and then any profit is used to reinvest back into the enterprise uh, to either expand our existing tours currently on offer, reach out to new guides, marketing purposes, etc. Um, so one of the main values that we have is to challenge the perceptions and stereotypes surrounding homelessness. So we do this by facilitating interactions between people from different walks of life who might not otherwise have a chance to connect in a meaningful way. So we want to revolutionize perceptions surrounding homelessness by really cutting through the stereotypes and the stigmas surrounding homelessness. And I think it's important here to uh, highlight what we're not. So we're not part of this poverty tourism agenda. We're not wanting to voyeuristically or superficially point out so socially or economically deprived areas and the people within them. Crucially, our tours are about homeless, uh, are, are not of the homeless people, but are with them. So this is an important distinction as this reverses the power balance between our homeless guides and mainstream society as the guides are the voices of authority who lead the tour. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Pete. who's gonna give you a bit of an insight into his Brick Lane tour. Uh, this is one of four tours that we have running at the moment. Others are Shoreditch, Camden, and London Bridge. So over to you. Thank you, Jen. She's one of our great volunteers. If you want to volunteer, we do need some more with, with uh, different skills, not just as directors, but marketers and everything. Um, so yeah, I do the Brick Lane tour. Right there. Yes, yeah, so look at the screen, not me, please. <laughs> um, I've been homeless around Brick Lane for about eight years now. There's in the summer in the streets, so I like it outdoors, and in the winter mostly in squats. But last December I was picked up by a street outreach team and now I'm in a hostel and hopefully before Christmas I'll get my own flat. Now I'm actually going to take you on a whistle top store tour of, my, of Brick Lane. Um, the area it's in is actually just on the border of Spitalfields and Whitechapel. Brick Lane splits those in two. Um, when we get to Whitechapel, because we actually meet at Oldgate Station, which is in the city, and there's a, a short walk to Whitechapel to Al Tabali Park, where um, in, in the 1970s there was a horrific murder by the National Front. Um, Al Tabali was over, stabbed over a hundred times. Um, and there was a massive demonstration, and the Clash played, and a few other postponed bands. And it turned out that over 30,000 people turned up for this demo. Um, then they had a march to 10 Downing Street where they handed in a petition with over 100,000 signatures. From this, the Race, Race Relations Act was formed and the NS were smashed. A lot of the tour, about 40% of the tour is street art. Brick Lane is very, very famous for street art. There's even a Banksy, that's where we finish up. But he's even, not even in my top 20 artists. This guy is, Jimmy C from Adelaide, Australia. Any Aussies in the house? Hey, he's from Adelaide. Adelaide? Huh? 
Melbourne, Melbourne. Yeah, you look too, too uh, healthy to be from Adelaide. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a portrait of Joe and his kid, um, which is commissioned when Joe Jr. there, the little girl, by, by her to Jimmy C. when her father died. It's a very poignant piece and very beautiful painted in pointillism. Further along, we go to the oldest building on Brick Lane that's still in use, the Christchurch Primary School. It's actually got a cemetery underneath it with 21 dead bodies under there. And if you want to know more, come on the tour. Shock One, another one of my favorite artists. To stand out in street art, you do have to have your own technique and your own style. Jimmy C's got pointillism. Obviously, this is X-ray. And you've never heard of these artists, have you? About halfway through the tour, we get to the Brick Lane Great Mosque, as it says there. Before that, it was a synagogue, and before that, it was a Protestant church with a long and twisted history. Rudinsky's Room. This is about a, a book I read by uh, a local teacher um, who found out her grandfather was kept as a slave because uh, he's a master silk weaver. And uh, one night he escaped his room naked and was found smashing windows on, uh, well, at Spitalfields Market. Very interesting story. My favourite actual artist there, Stick. Anyone recognise those figures? Stick? You seen them around? Yeah. Uh, he's, from, uh, the, he's from England, but he won't tell anyone where he's from because when he's 16, his dad kicked him out for being gay. And now he's an internationally famous, successful artist who's a millionaire. Uh, on the right there, there's another one of my favourites, Osh. And like, like I said, to stick out in the street art field or any art, you've got to be good and have your own style. Ah, my local shop. <laughs> I've been going there for years since it opened. Uh, so I was really amazed to find out that in 1797, actually, opened as the first soup kitchen in Britain, right there. The first ever. Wow. Banksy, this is where we finished the tour. Yes, that purple car there is a Banksy. Yeah, I'm always underwhelmed. Oh, sorry, it's a match girl strike first, sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing. All right, sorry, match girl strike. Anyone heard of this? Yeah? Uh, in 1888, just before Jack the Ripper murders, which are on the tour as well, of course, some match girls went on strike and, well, changed history, basically. It's also why you call a strike a strike. You strike a match. Here's the Banksy. <laughs> yeah, that purple car there was originally on Brick Lane. Now it's in a, a courtyard at the back of the Truman Brewery. And in 2010, they bought it for one million pounds. Wow, just because it's a Banksy. And I do have a market stall on Brick Lane now. I've got two jobs. If you've ever been to Brit Lane, you'll know this style. Lucha Libre, anyone? No? Okay. Mexican wrestling to you and me. So come and visit me, even if you don't come on the tour. Well, that's all for now. Do you have any questions? Anything? Any questions? Oh, thank you. <laughs> any questions? I'll just ask one last question. Okay, great. There we go. <laughs> How do you think tourism and the work you have been doing has um, improved the way of life or the, maybe the self-esteem of people in Brick Lane like you or elsewhere in London? Uh, very good question. Uh, uh, financially, of course, it's changed. But one of our main um, points, really, is to change perception of people who are homeless. I mean, not all of us are smelly tramps. I know it's bad to say that. And not all of us are crackheads and smackheads as well. Although I do talk about that on the tour and the social reasons for it. Thank you. And one of the things. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to move on because we've got one more talk to get in before ten thirty. Did you want to say something? Sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. Thank no, you. No, we'll say it because we're <laughs> yeah. setting up. So go ahead. Perfect. I say it was just to say that as one of the parts of challenging these stereotypes and perceptions surrounding homelessness. Um, how uh, Unseen Tours came about. We were inspired by an informal volunteer network called Sock Mob, who run weekly uh, 
to like tours around London or walks to uh, engage with people on the streets using the ice breaking power of just giving a pair of socks. And we were really inspired by the voices um, that we'd spoken to on these tours and the resourcefulness and creativity of these people that often don't have um, access to paid opportunities um, available then to harness all of these skills. So that's how our organization was born. Thank you everyone. Um, my name is Alba. I'm the brand trainer and activator uh, at Good Hotel London. It's a hotel that is just uh, next door, so I really recommend you to visit it and to, to, to feel yourself and to have the experience there. Um, today I'm going to share with you about uh, a different way of uh, doing businesses, slightly similar as uh, my colleagues uh, before. So Good Hotel started in Guatemala. Uh, our CEO and founder, Martin, he went backpacking in Guatemala. He met uh, this girl, Mirna. Uh, he was uh, volunteering in a, in a day childcare and he decided to buy Mirna a pair of shoes. And this is when he realized that uh, he could even do better. So something else for Mirna, for her family and for the community. So after that, after meeting Mirna, um, Martin decided to found Niños de Guatemala. Nowadays, Niños de Guatemala is an international uh, recognized NGO. Uh, it's running three schools and educating 500 people, 500 uh, children. Sorry. So 500 children. Uh, it's located in Ciudad Vieja, nearby Antigua. Antigua is a UNESCO protected city. So after created, after founded uh, Niños de Guatemala, Martin started thinking about how to sustainable uh, support this NGO. And this is when he started thinking about a different business model that is based on two different paradoxes. First one is about how to do business, but at the same time doing good. So we aim to have profits, but we also aim to run social projects. And the second paradox is how to do good, but also offering premium quality. Because it's not because we are a social that we are not focused on providing good experience to guests. So. This is the two paradox that um, help Martin to, to create a good hotel. We also um, we, we want to do all this, uh, all this business based on people, and this is um, how we create our values. So we do business, we do good, we offer premium quality, we love people, people is the core, uh, and we also love to think differently. And this is how we can um, name our business model. So we are premium hospitality with a cost. We are a profit for non-profit business offering beautiful hospitality experience. So we aim for profits, but we reinvest the profits on the business to grow and on our social projects. But how we do good, because uh, sometimes it's a bit soft, but we have uh, specific goals. So we measure our success by the number of unemployed locals we help move out of unemployment. So I'm going to talk about it later, but mainly we want to train people within the hospitality industry, the same amount of people as uh, the staff working in each hotel. Also, the total, the, the percentage of total sourcing that goes to local business. So we aim that 70% of our suppliers that they are from the local area, and the number of kids educated, as mentioned before, nowadays is fun, uh, 500 kids that we educate, and cash donations to NGO partners. So uh, every direct booking, uh, we 
we take five pounds for the NGO and more or less is 40% of our bookings is direct bookings and five pounds goes to the NGO. So we started in Amsterdam, a good hotel is a Dutch company and um, we stayed there for a year in Amsterdam. After a year, because we are a floating platform, you can see the picture on the corner on the left, on the right, sorry. Um, after a year in Amsterdam, we moved the platform with a submersible platform and then um, pushing by a boat, as you can see in the picture. It was challenging, as you can imagine, because we had to cross the channel, um, taking in consideration weather conditions and, well, it was a big project. Uh, but then um, it arrived a year ago, the platform, and so then we uh, introduced the profit for non-profit business into the London hotel scene. In the meantime, in between Amsterdam and London, we open in Guatemala, so in Antigua. It's a former private mansion. It's a boutique hotel, 20 rooms. We are now thinking in renovate it and make it bigger. We are um, we train there uh, all the staff. It's uh, most of them they are single moms, and they are the moms of the kids at the schools run run by niños de Guatemala. So we offer also a job to the moms, and this is how we create and we close uh, the circle. So we also partner with uh, local uh, business, and in Guatemala, all the profits goes to the NGO. And we are now here in London. We opened uh, 2nd December last year, so it's almost a year now since we are open. It's a redesigned floating platform. Um, it's industrial design. We are lucky because we have views so, uh, on the river, so it's a unique property in London. We have four, uh, 148 rooms, and um, mainly the way that we do good here in London is through the good training program that I'm leading. So we train, we aim to train 60 people per year the same as number of staff that we have currently at the hotel. This program started in Antigua, uh, sorry, in Amsterdam. Um, we, they trained there 100 people. Uh, we aim for 70% rate of success, meaning that 70% of the trainees, they find a long-term job. This is uh, here in London. We partner with Newham Workplace, so this is also how we, we try to be as local as possible. So New and Workplace help us to recruit uh, candidates. And um, we are, this year we already train three groups. So first group is uh, almost everyone is already working. I really want to thank our partner hotels. We have uh, Park Plaza, Westminster, and that's uh, London, Liverpool Street. So we have good hotels that they are really interested in participating with uh, this good training program. And second group is currently uh, looking for a job. And third group, you can meet them because they are now doing the work experience. So the program is uh, one month in classroom sessions and three months paid work experience. So we want to also grow sustainably, um, but we already have a plan. So for the, five, for the following five years, we want to open 10 new properties. Uh, this is also a way um, for us to inspire other business to be a social business. And uh, so we want to be on the, in the main uh, touristic destinations. And that's it. If you have any question, please. Are there any questions? None at all? Yes, sure. I will give it to you. Okay, it's, well, it's, it's very easy to go there. So if you go outside this, this door here, you just follow the river. It's a big platform, black. 
So we have good coffee, and then you can meet our trainees and our staff. They will be very happy to welcome you. And anyone who likes talking about responsible tourism in the evenings after they've finished work, tomorrow evening we'll be having a networking evening to talk about responsible tourism at the Good Hotel. From seven o'clock onwards. Fran Hughes International Tourism Partnership. Great, we'd love to do a feature on Green Hotelier on this. Um, but I wanted to know, have you tried to engage the online travel agents to support? I notice you say that the direct bookings get the five pound donation, but those, it, the other bookings which are indirect? Not really, so far we have the support of uh, booking.com. They have a boost uh, program. So we won this program because uh, Booking.com is trying to support also sustainable uh, business. But so far it's the only approach we have had from uh, agencies. Going hard on them. Yeah.